Okay, hi. Uh, yeah, my name is Joyce, and I'm here to talk about the Veritas Gold Computing Project today. So today, I'm just going to talk about these few things. Why do we care about Veritas Gold Computing Project? Why do things like FPGAs in Veritas Gold Computing, right? What existing works out there, you know, design code, so that sort of thing. What I will not cover is things like computer architecture, digital design, and VS, VLS sound design. Those are more complicated topics that I'm not going to I'm not going to delve into today. So, what do these devices have in common? They are all computers. All of them, from the servers to your phones to even programmable logic uh, controllers and industrial devices, all of them are processors, all of them are computers, right? So, why should we care? So, in, in, for any user perspective, let's say you're a journalist, you're going on a sensitive assignment, and let's say you want to, you want to do an interview, right? In a sensitive location. If I put my plane into if my phone that thing will can I be sure that it really is in a thing that it's not transmitting anything? Right now, we don't have that. Right? But uh, even for a chip designer, if I send a chip design to a fab, how do I know that the chips I get are exactly what I get? That's it exactly as for my design files, right? Right now, it's very difficult to verify, as I'm going to show. I do have a real life example. For several months right now, a few of a bunch of us actually have been harassed by a certain harasser known as Mercury, who has actually taken to compromising some of our friends' devices, such as an iPhone 10 and a MacBook. And I mean these are the parts inside your MacBook, right? And they use uh, you can see that they use a bunch of Chips that are made by Apple, and you know what you're doing, how they work, you don't know what firmware is actually running on it, right? And it's taken from the Wikipedia page of the Apple T2 chip on, uh, found in 2018 when they the MacBooks. There are a bunch of security, security flaws and vulnerabilities found, which allow for certain, for certain things like you know, you're able to run code on this course and certain things like that. And in this case, this person has effectively said, you know, hey, you know, I've got this phone, right? And not just the phone, but the MacBook itself, and able to tell that this person is here, you know, at home. And the question is, how did the phone get up even? How did the MacBook get up even? When I checked with, the, with this person, they said, they locked it, they, they left it on the but they locked it. So how did the map, how did the hour even get on it? They don't even know, isn't it? And for the phone, the adversary was able to tell us every single thing that was said on the Zoom call, they were able to tell us police forensics were not able to find any trace of software, presumably because it was white. The phone is not even jailbroken by the owner. The owner is not even a technical person and does not know how to jailbreak these things, right? So as you can see, many consumer devices nowadays are made of device only black boxes. And you do not know how they operate or how they work, and what sort of security flaws and vulnerabilities exist in their phone, even in the chips itself. And when you talk about hardware, this is a simple inverter circuit. So if I were to put Let's say zero in the input, I get a one in output, and vice versa, right? So here is two designs, two inverter designs on a chip. But try spotting the difference here. It's actually very difficult to see, but you can tell, if you look closely, you can see that, hey, the doping has been changed, right? In this section, compared to this section. So it is a P doping instead of N doping, the original design. So what happens? No matter what you do, no matter what input you do, this inverter will always remain on. It will only just give you one, right? And when you apply that to things like, you know, more complex circuit, like an Intel processor, for example, one of the one of the things that we may be interested in is things like random number generation uh, generators used for encryption. In, you know, we have end to end encryption and other forms of encryption tech, right? Or well, things like SSL, 
that sort of thing. But you need to start somewhere, you need to get a, a random seed from somewhere, right? This is how it's generated in hardware. Right? So this is how that works, how that looks like in the Intel implementation for this what's called the Ivy Bridge design, right? So as that you have well this is your AES. You have two registers, the state register K and C, and the C is incremented by one all, all the time, right? So what happens if I set state register K to some fixed value in hardware by you know by mod, by inserting a hardware through this hardware so that my register here is always a fixed value? And I can set the state register C so that I can now decrease. So let's say you have a 256 bit T, right? I can effectively reduce the key complexity to less than 256 bit. And guess what? In, the, in this uh, in this example, this thing will still pass the biggest outlets. And as you can see, the truth is very, very, very difficult to spot this, right? Because even if you use what is that it's very, very difficult to spot this, right? Because even if you use uh, like scanning electron microscope, there's no need to see it. You're just changing the token, you're not changing the structure itself. So yeah. So yeah, and in this in this the paper, I'm not going to get to what paper says right and all that. But yes, it reduces as they say, it reduces the text complexity from 128 bits, for example, to just n bits and chosen by whoever implements this attack. Right? And as it says, the children, the hardware children can pass the built-in subtest unprecedented. As I said earlier, because you are all you're just doing is changing the grouping levels, right, in the chip itself, but you're not changing the structure of the chip. There's no way to find this children, either the scanning electron microscopy. And there's the only way to detect this if you is if you have a golden chip and you compare all your production samples with a golden chip. So it's hard and see it's very difficult to know that you know. Something's been tampered with. If you don't even know that it's been tampered in the beginning, you have to know it's there already before you can look for it. And it's very difficult to inspect this, right? To figure out like where the fat process is compromised. And this is the sort of thing that a state level actor, right? A well fund actor could do. Unfortunately, there's no uh, open source chip fabrication process as yet. Although work is being done in this space. Such as, well, a very famous example, Sansa Luz, uh, you know, Z2 chip, which has literally for a thousand of, of transistors on chip. And this is all done at home, by the way. This is his lab, all at home. I, and I think it's an older picture. So, yeah. So, I'm not going to get, like, you know, I'm not trying to say, you know, we should be all, all, all our own fabs and things like that at home. Well, that, that becomes very expensive. Uh, what we can use are uh, FPGAs because they are general purpose, right? And they're used in all sorts of applications from networking to uh, the networking, radio, and a lot of applications. So it's very difficult to target, like, you know, a certain batch of FPGAs to say, you know, I want to modify this batch, but I have no idea where, that, uh, where a batch of FPGAs will go into and they go to all sorts of applications. So it's, it's much more difficult to target from a supply chain perspective, right? And if you write HDL code, you can actually inspect that code and can verify the operation of the hardware distribution language code. And yes, if you so desire, you can even modify your devices if you have HDL. And this is the general structure of the FPGA. So you have a bunch of configurable logic blocks. And uh, you know, at the side of the chips, you have your in output blocks. And you may have other blocks like memory, multipliers, and things like that in between. So, in a specific design, the lattice size for the FPGAs, this is how, like, a general overview of how the FPG looks like. And this, and each of these PLEs are your programmable logic blocks, right? And this is how the programmable logic blocks look like. Very, to simplify all this, what you are doing, what all you're just doing is to configure, you, if you program this lookup table here, you 
you can say that okay, from certain set of inputs, right? And a certain you know clock, for example, let, let's say a rising edge, falling edge. I can on my output I give you a certain, I give you a certain behavior, a certain output that, that is the clock of things like that, or clock edge, basically. And the IO value of IO cell looks like this. So you can configure the input, output, and things like that. All just by writing code in the hardware description language. There are certain already existing works, such as well, Bunny's precursor, which is well it's supposed to be in kit, right? Where you can actually experiment with FBJs and you know and mobile communications and the like. It also has like its own Wi-Fi device and that sort of thing. And inside, and inside this is how it looks like. So you actually have an idea of how this whole device looks, works, right? You have your embedded controller here, which handles all your power and whatnot. And then this is the main processor itself, is this five, uh, 32 bit processor, which also handles things like encryption keys and whatnot. And this is how the gateware, right? Which is, you know, your, your very long VHDL code and this synthesizes how it looks like, and it's what implements in your gateway basically. So when you start off with an FPGA project, what you're doing, so what you're doing is that you're doing things like okay, I'm designing like a I'm getting a sense of like what's a high level design, right? Like what's my design supposed to do? Then you know I write my code in whatever hardware description I wish, whether it be very long or VHDL, and then I, you know I can synthesize that design, I can do Simulation. Then once I'm done simulating that, I can actually, I can actually implement the design and synthesize place and do the case and things like that. And then the final output, the bit stream, can be programmed into an FPGA, a like physical FPGA device. So the three general processors for FP, uh, FPGA design flow are synthesis. So you take your your hardware distribution language and convert it in a netlist file. <coughs> That describes the logical connection of the blocks, right? Of your IO blocks or the configurable logic blocks and that sort of thing. The place and group takes that synthesized design and turns it into a physical implementation based on specific FPGA. So if you're using styling, so it creates a bar for that, right? A bit stream for that. If you're using lattice ice for it gives you a bar for that, basically. Yes, yeah, so your final process is to generate a bit stream. Which is then put this final file and put the program into the device. There are some open source, because of this fossil agent, right? So there's some open source tools for that, like Yosis or Synthesis. You have next place and root as ER, or this place and rooting, and this stream generation, which projects like F4 PGA, covers a whole bunch of uh, devices like ice the lattice, ice for EC, define, designs, and so on. What I want to talk about, because I'm using that, right? It's something called LightX. It's a framework for building a system on chips, right? So, modular processors and whatever, not things like PCIe, Ethernet, and so on, in a VGA design. So, you can build things like RISC-V processors combined with some other peripheral like PCIe or you know, Ethernet. And this thing supports, this uses my uh, which is a file distribution language based. Of Python, they can easily customize your own design to with whatever peripherals or whatever functionality you want. So yeah, this this is just all the devices the box, you know, and the open source IPs or whatever peripherals that they call it, right? So yeah. So I have an example design which I'm gonna demonstrate today using a uh, a series 215. This is how this is what the design kind of looks like, right? Although I don't have the SSD and so on. So in code, I can actually change all my definitions, like what pins, like what the input and output pins, what they do, so on, so forth. I can change that in code. It's unlike you know like a physical chip where it's all set in code. I can actually change the code. I can change the functionality. It's you know based on my needs. I can hack my device basically. So why RIS5? So the processor here, we're using RIS5. So why do we use that? Because it's an open source instruction set architecture. And it's a very simple one. It uses less than 50 instructions to implement the most basic 32-bit integer instruction set for RIS5. And the spec itself is already 
frozen, although you can make your own custom extension. So if you want to build something that's not, if you want some feature or something that's not supported, like the spec itself, you can do like that. And this is just how the instruction set looks like. All lens in one table. This is just for this type of integer. So the, the acorn is basically a Mining. This used to be like a mine, uh, cryptocurrency miner device, which yeah. now well, it's not profitable anymore to use for mining. So you can buy a whole bunch of these for less than hundred US dollars nowadays. And this is the dot diagram of the device and what it has, right? And it uses a Zynex Arctic Seven. In fact, the highest end FPGA in the Arctic Seven family, which would cost a few hundred dollars usually. You can get a board now for less than 100 if you know where to look. And right now, in the office, I have one set up. I was not able to build the next day for some reason, but yes, uh, I have a demo coming up right now. I, of course, I didn't. I did not bring the device because the, the last time we did this for Geek Camp, there was a lot of stuff to bring, right? So I just have it set up on the remote desktop in the office, and I'll show how that looks like now. Okay, let's see. Okay, no, not this. Let's do a reboot. So, yeah, so yeah, I think, of course, I think I was trying to compile this one, so you saw the scene that was behind, but I didn't manage to get it more to compile work in time for the demo, but the bias itself. And this starts up. That starts up. And you can see, you know, like the fabric has a mix of that. It's now just waiting for good image to send to it. So, yeah, some of so there are two projects that uh, I'm working on right now, which is the RISC-V laptop, which is supposed to be a verifiable laptop design based on a RISC-V processor implemented on FPGA. And the other project is the Airwave project, which is similar to the laptop, where we, look, we are investigating the possibility of implementing the mobile uh, communication stack, right? The same ones use your mobile phones. Well, FPGA and uh, like your, a software defined radio transceiver. So, this is what we are working on currently. And, you know, for the top, I expect like a prototype to appear like uh, the third quarter this year. So we have some references uh, in regards to this topic. Of course, we have Bunny's precursor, and oh, and his project is actually very well documented. You want to check it out. Lightx, of course, that's the tool I'm using for this demo. And the final link actually shows how to actually build Linux, right? On and implement a processor on FPGA and things like that. Full working demo, you know, all that. And this is the paper for the. Uh, hardware uh, stealthy hardware children that I talked about earlier in my presentation. And this is where you can find me. That's it. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Joyce. Uh, questions? I'm sure there'll be a dozen. A uh, few of us. Very good talk. Um, I would love to have one of these laptops. So, What's like the, the clock rate of, of this risk five running inside the FPGA? The current clock rate is actually, if I remember correctly, is set at 100 megahertz. So it's currently set at 100 megahertz, so it's not that fast, right? So the thing I'm actually trying to figure out, first you have your uh, Xilinx 7 series, and they have the Arctic, so you, in this demo, we have the highest end Arctic 7, right? As I said, it goes up here at least $100. And then you have the Next line, the next in the line is the Kintech 7, which supposedly the fabric is 
much faster than that, or not much, but somewhat faster than the Kindex uh, supposedly. So what I'm trying to figure out is for a given clock uh, speed, what's the performance like? So I have to do like benchmarking and things like that for the processor, and you know expect to publish those results once I once I get there. Uh, the, uh, so the chip would also be the drive to display everything, or, or do you? Yeah, yeah. So there are LTDS, uh, like IOs and the FPGA itself. So, so the display control itself should be able. You should be able to implement it on the FPGA. Maybe you need, you know, like another additional one of the chips, or HDMI, or whatever display that you're using. So yeah. Any other question? Any other question? Yes. Uh, yeah. Cool talk. Um. You were talking about LaTeX and you are talking about Eosys. So does, how does it work? So do you program your stuff in MyGen and then you give it to Eosys and that, that compiles it down? Okay, so uh, what's that? Okay, so LaTeX itself is basically just a, a set of tools, right? So, uh, so if I remember correctly, it uses something called FHDL, so it's like a device similar to Python, it's a Python uh, description language, right? So you can build modules. You can build modules in FHDL, which then can be added to a large edge project and compile a system of code you know, from there, right? So yeah, I'm still experimenting with like the two chains such that I you know I hope that I understand how like how to use it better. So yeah. Alright, um last question. So if you're talking about like a targeted state level attack, you're probably better off buying a real chip because you know you can pay cash to someone, get a CPU, and then there's no more surface area to attack it. Whereas if you use a soft CPU like this, you can be constantly under attack. I mean, if someone manages to get access to the computer, they can probably replace the the FPGA configuration with a Trojan one. Whereas you know, it's much harder to physically replace the CPU without detecting that, right? So, so what is the like, what is the scope here? Are we talking about like untargeted state actor level threats, or like, it, it's a bit confusing to me how the like, yeah how, how, how FPGA is and and you know given how complex the translations from HDR to bit streams are, so it's not like a human can possibly really tell that the bit stream has not been compromised. I mean, you have a point, but what I want to say is first, you have physical access to the device, then no matter whether you have a hard, you are know, using like a hard off the shelf processor or a soft core processor in FPGA, you have a device that was basically finished to begin with. If a hacker only has physical access to the device, that is, as for, you know, the, the Gateway itself, right? This is a this is a problem I'm actually thinking about, and I'm actually looking at not just people in sensitive positions, right, but also for end users. And I, and basic question is this: What sort of tests can an end user do? You know, if let's say I get the device, you know, it's preloaded some bit stream. So, what sort of tests can a user do? What sort of things can the user do? You know, what do you know? Like what do they know about these tests, right? For them to be confident that you know the device is actually clean. So those are some questions I'm actually working on at the moment, and I don't have an answer for that as yet. Uh, I think we are actually run out of time, so we already over past our half our schedule time slot. So I'm sorry I can't take it, but why didn't you ask her subsequently? All right. So thank you very much.